There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view. Well, you will. And we're, we're joined by Simon Barber and Brian O'Connor, who are individually songwriters and, and collectively the Soda Jerkers. And I think they spend, they spend their time, as far as I can ascertain, doing two things. One is writing songs, and two is talking to people who write songs in a podcast, the Soda Jerkers podcast, which has probably done even more installments than we have. Gentlemen, welcome. Hello. Welcome. Lovely to see you. Thanks Love for having us. You. Yeah. Where do, where do we find you? Yeah, you're in Liverpool, is that right? I'm in Liverpool currently. Yeah, I'm just outside Birmingham. But we're both uh, from Liverpool originally. Right. But you, do you, you work together? How did, tell us about how you, how you met and how this whole thing started. Were you in a band in Liverpool beforehand? I think you were, weren't you? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So we met at school, basically, didn't we, Brian? We did, yeah. It's over 30 years ago now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we weren't friends to begin with. We were in the same like form class, and then um, we became friends maybe sort of year year eight, year nine kind of thing. And um, Simon was already in a band at that point with a couple of other lads in our year, and uh, they needed a bass player. They didn't didn't even have a drummer at that point, but they needed a bass player. Um, and so I sort of picked up the bass in order to join um, their band, and then that very quickly dissolved, and me and Sai carried on kind of jamming together and writing songs together. And who were you writing songs for? How, how did that work? What kind of what kind of songwriting was it? Really just um, alternative pop, rock type stuff for our own ends, really, just so we could get gigs around Liverpool and be in a band like pretty much everyone you meet in Liverpool. Right. Yeah. And what kind of songs were those? I mean, what kind of songwriters did you grow up listening to? Well, it, I mean, the kind of classic stuff, really. I mean, we were both sort of into the Beatles from a, from a young age, and um, that's an obvious one. But I, kind of around the time we became a band, we were listening to a lot of kind of grunge and Red Hot Chili Peppers, all that kind of thing. This is, you know, this is the early to mid-90s, so that was very much uh, the thing. Um, it was slightly pre, but just on the verge of Britpop, but we weren't really into that at the time. That's something I guess we kind of grew to appreciate later on, but at the time it wasn't really our thing. So. I guess it was in the sort of, you know, kind of alt rock vein, maybe. Right, right. Yeah. And so we, go on, carry on. I was on. gonna say, and then we sort of um went on to study music and got more exposed to different types of music, I would say, later on. And that's when we started visiting record shops around Liverpool and mining all the old sort of seventies and eighties records that we hadn't really heard to that point. Oh really? So was that a journey of discovery, was it? I think so, yeah. And whenever you attend like a music school or a music college, you meet a lot of jazzers, you know, people who are really technically proficient and they're always listening to kind of fusion and stuff like that. So I think that opened up the the sort of uh, mainstream rock that we were listening to and we started hearing, you know, people like, I don't know, Al Jura or people like that for the first time and started going, oh, listen to the, the players on those records. And I think that probably informed our sort of passion for knowing the minutiae of who was on these records from that yeah. era, you know. So, so give us a quick idea of that. So, so did Jokers podcast for those who haven't heard it, because you've, you've in, you basically, you talk to a different songwriter every time mm -hmm. and it's a staggering range of people. That's the, that's the really impressive thing. Give us an idea of the range. Well, you've got, um, I mean, Paul McCartney, he, he, he always has to, has to headline, I think. Um, Alicia Keys, uh, Oak Sparks, um, Paul Simon, Sting, uh, Simon, help me. Well, we've got... Jackie um, DeShannon, you did, didn't you? Mike Jackie Stoller? Jackie DeShannon. Yeah, Mike Stoller. Yeah, we've gone back into the archives and had, you know, sort of Brill Building era songwriters on as well, like Mike Stoller or Neil Sedaka, people like that, you know? Right, right. So, absolutely. so you've got a real kind of admiration for the craft and interest in the craft and you you're always interested in finding out how people do things is that fair to say well, absolutely basically yeah yeah, yeah. And, and the amount of things you discover about the ways in which it's done it's just endlessly fascinating give to... us some examples of that because i mean that's that's what have you learned from particular people who told you some specific thing that you've you've incorporated to the way you operate well, I mean, there's a myriad of, 
of ways in which people go about it. Everything from the sort of more kind of routine work a day approach of people like Neil Sedaka who will get up and sit at the piano at nine o'clock in the morning and and write all day if they've got a project on to people who write in a more kind of inspired singer songwriterly kind of way um, or people who have various routines for gathering information. They'll be very alert for snippets from movies or books or things they might overhear and they'll note all that stuff down accumulate a lot of material and then they'll write from their journals um or there's i guess um an expansion of that more kind of work a day approach that i mentioned is the sort of modern production approach where people are just kind of working in a digital audio workstation coming up with beats coming up with snippets this is which it. they then top lines top this line, is it i mean yeah. it was songwriting it's songwriting is just it's changed, doesn't it? So much, you know, that I suppose what what people still think of as traditional songwriters was kind of two guys in a in a cell off Broadway. So <laughs> one guy on a piano, one guy yeah. smoking a cigar, pacing up and down, coming up with the lyrics, you know what I mean? And then it's moved on through the years, hasn't it? To yeah. the- Although in a sense, it's ultimately the same thing you know because those guys and they might have heard oh the drifters are recording next week we need a, a song for them and then barry Mann rushes to the piano with cynthia Weil or whatever it's these days it's you know if you're in a kind of a factory environment if you like and they've got a brief for someone who needs a, a record or someone who's doing a record and is going to need songs pitched to them then they go and sit down they write a chorus they give it to their friend their friend top lines it's someone else puts a bridge on it and it, it's actually not that dissimilar. But I suppose they don't even have to meet any longer, do they? Stuff can be just sent back <laughs> no. and forth. That, that's, Absolutely, yeah. That's the other thing. And well, do look, they sit we... down with the artist occasionally, don't they? And, and draw because when when Dave and I were at Smash Hits, we, we were always impressed by the fact that pop stars were were kind of comparatively old. You know, the Human League, ABC, whatever. They'd had lives that they could write about their own experiences, and the whole stage school thing happened. So you had people who were just teenagers who didn't really have that much life. So now you have somebody today who who will sit with that artist and try and draw out uh, information about their life that could be turned into a song. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. I mean, um, like someone like Dan Wilson, for example, who's a Grammy winning songwriter and uh, he was the front man of Semisonic originally, but um, became this kind of songwriter for hire. And um, we had him on the show and he talked about writing with with Adele um, oh. and how when they first met, um, before they wrote a thing, they, they talked to each other. Yeah. He asked them what was going on in their life. She told yeah. them. They, they shared kind of music recommendations. They watched like YouTube clips, and um, and then he spent kind of hours doing that before a, a note of music was written. That that seems to be a, a kind of essential component of the, of the it, co-writing it, session. So interesting. It, it, it's a little bit like in business; they call it coaching, don't they? They, when they send somebody to sit with the chief executive and say, "Just tell me about your problems." Yeah. <laughs> they, they're hoping that they'll get out of it whatever is the the key issue. Well, look. Exactly. It's, well, look, what we asked you to do, I don't know if you've had a chance to do this, chaps, is, is just pick out a few things uh, from, your, from your personal musical history uh, that, that uh, got you into this and have particular significance for you. Who, who wants to start with this? Simon, do you want to start with this? Yeah, shall I shall I look for an instrument? Yeah, oh go on. Yeah, go on. Well, yeah. Yes, you're up here. You're making some so time behind you. Have you. A selection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so this one, if you can see, yeah, this is the highly desirable limited edition 1992 Falcon by Tanglewood, <laughs> <laughs> which I imagine would command about 40 English pounds in the current market. But this was my first guitar. This was the guitar I got when I was 92, probably, I don't know, 13. And uh, wrote all my first songs on this instrument. Right. So you didn't start with an acoustic guitar or anything like that. You went straight in with that. Uh, I think there was a, a, a sort of a beat up nylon string guitar knocking around before that, which I didn't really pay that much attention to. But then my sister's boyfriend um, had an electric guitar. And I was, I think, inspired by seeing Back to the Future in 1985 and seeing, you know, the electric guitar as like this oh, right. symbol of, uh, you know, a, a sort of a very powerful symbol and and uh, I decided well I, I'll I'll try that out so I got him to bring it round and plug it into the auxiliary socket of our hi-fi at home <laughs> well, I've got, got to learn how to do this so I must have badgered my parents for this and uh, got this in 92 and started learning on it so still in well it's largely unplayable these days to be honest 
still roughly in sounds all right. So, uh, did, you, right. did you did you do you write a song on that? No, oh, I wrote many songs on this. Yeah, can you remember the first you one? The title you wrote? of the first song you wrote. That's good. I think the first one, embarrassingly enough, was called Fire and Ice. Yay! <laughs> That's new to me. I didn't even yeah. know that. It sounds like something from um, some sort of Eurovision spoof, doesn't it? How old? Yeah, yeah, were, yeah. How old were you at the time? That's the interesting. Question. I would say thirteen or fourteen. So thirteen. Probably. 13, the idea of a 13-year-old thinking about fire and ice is quite... <laughs> That's sophisticated. <laughs> a 13-year-old who thinks of himself as a Viking or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 13-year-olds never write songs about what's really going on in 13-year-old minds, do they? You know, no. They, Simon no, was beyond his years as, as a songwriter even then. He really was. I could make neither head nor tail of most of his lyrics at that point. <laughs> Probably because nothing, they weren't very good. <laughs> no, no, there was just nothing linear. It, you know, it was it was all very shrouded in kind of metaphor, and and you know, I really struggled with it for for, for a long time. I, I was also just really impressed, and he could come out with this stuff because he just seemed to be able to do it quite naturally. And he was writing poetry at that point as well. And I think words have, have always been size strength. He would right. be modest to say that, but I'll say it for him. Okay. Oh, so what you. what have you got, Brian? Well, um, I've got my first bass guitar. Uh, that's, that's right. Start out on still my pr main instrument, and this is a uh, Fender Squire jazz bass, um, bought by my dad uh, in I think the summer of '94 um, in Rushworth in Liverpool. You may have heard of that show. Oh right, okay, yes, I've heard that's of that. That's where, um, well, that's where Paul McCartney got his first acoustic guitar, his Zenith, uh, guaranteed not to split. I think he, I think that was what it said on it. Um, which is really, <laughs> I think he had a trumpet originally. His dad had bought him a trumpet. Yes, his dad did. was a trumpet player, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. and uh, and he couldn't play that very well, so he, and he wanted to trade him for a guitar. So he took it back and got a Zenith. I think John and um, George got their first Gibson acoustics from Rushworths as well. Um, but yeah, that was a music shop on uh, Whitechapel in Liverpool City Centre. It's not there now, um, but Whitechapel was kind of. Uh, Sort of our Denmark Street, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. You had, you had Rushworth, you had Hesse's, you had um, Curly Music. Curly still exists in a form in, elsewhere in town now, but there was kind of a row of these music shops, which we used to frequent back then. So, yeah, so this is my first base. My dad got some money off because there's a, a couple of chips in the paintwork there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, can, can you remember your first composition? Oh, I did actually, the first melody I think I wrote was on this bass because I think I was listening to um, a lot of Marcus Miller at the time, the uh, okay. esteemed uh, jazz bassist. I mean, I, he, I still, you were, you were well, how old the whole time? That's sophisticated that. too. Well, I was, just get, I was just getting into all things bass, so any any sort of decent bass player I was, I was into, be it from McCartney, Sting, you know, Jameson or whoever, to the kind of jazzes and stuff and and Marcus Miller like played, you know, melodies on the bass on his solo records. So I think I tried to write something like a Marcus Miller kind of melody, and, th and we ended up working it into a song. Si, um, we had the mm -hmm. song called "Too Pure to Be Pink," yeah. um, <laughs> which is a line from Greece, isn't it? I think it's a line from Greece, that yeah. Yeah, and we worked that into the chorus later on. So the first ever melodic line I ever wrote was on this bass. My, the theory, my theory is, I'm, and I'm new, and no musician, I'm the only non-musician on this screen here. Mark plays a bit, and Alex plays a lot, is in the background. I, I, I think reading about the Beatles, the, the reason the Beatles are so good is they made Paul McCartney be the bass player. And Paul McCartney was, was the best musician in the group. And the rest yeah. of them thought being the bass player is a bit beneath them, whereas they made him do it. Yeah. That's right. That, that was the single best decision they made, virtually, wasn't it? Absolutely I, I amazing. Was, and the, and the reason he did it was because the other two flatly refused. They just said, oh, there's no way I'm going to do it. And he made some really funny comment about, I didn't want to be the bass player first, because the bass player was the kind of kind of chubby guy at the back of the ba and jazz band, isn't he? Yeah. You know, they just didn't exactly. think it suited him. Yeah, I guess they just knew that if anyone could make a decent fist of it, it would be Paul. But I suppose it's also... You can only do it if you're thinking of the band. If you're putting the band above yourself, can't you? You know what I mean? It's it's in the interest of the band that somebody good do it. 
Therefore, yeah. he's going to do it. You know. I mean, yeah. I wish I could say that was the case with our band. Brian literally yeah, <laughs> was handed a bass in our first rehearsal. I turned up and had never picked the instruments up before. And the uh, the singer had an old, well, it wasn't old, but it was an, on, an encore bass, I think, and a catalogue job, basically. Um, like a friend of precision copy. And I literally turned up at size house one day and went into the front room. They were all waiting for me. And they like handed me this bass and I just kind of, Found the notes of the chords and off I went, and then right. it was for another year or so till it till I bought that one. So well, you you've had McCartney as one of your guests. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What did he tell you that you found most uh, you know anything new? Well, there's always something new. I think what was interesting for us about that was we knew we only had half an hour with him, <laughs> and there was no point in sort of trying to rehash the history because it's no, just no. so overwhelming. So we thought, well, let's try and get a portrait of him as a songwriter now. What is he actually up to right now? And I really got a sense of how he sort of structures his life to allow time to just sit at the piano and do stuff, especially late at night, I think he said. Mm-hmm. You know, um, when everyone's in bed, he'll just sort of sit down and noodle around with stuff. And he's still got that incredible sense of melody. I mean, that stuff just still comes to him all the time. And so I, I really got a sense that he was still quite naturally engaged with the process. You know, he was still really enjoying it. Mm. But so, he's, a, he's a melody first uh, character, I think, isn't he? And then writes some lyrics. Whereas you've got the best of John Lennon who thought of himself principally as a lyricist who then went and set that to music. Would that be right, do you think? I would, I would say so, yeah. I think maybe they're kind of maybe intertwined in, in Paul's case. I think, yeah. I think he is always sort of, you know, I guess maybe the music will conjure something as he's playing. And so he'll sort of marry the words to a, to a lyric as he, as he writes the melodies perhaps. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I mean, he is, he obviously he's one of the greatest sort of melody writers there is. So I think he is, he is sort of working from that basis to start with, but I think he brings the words in quite quickly. I don't think he sort of has a, chord sequence and a melody and then he tries to like attach yeah. the words to the like a finished melody i think that the sort of the two things are sort of bound up in each other yeah and oftentimes what you find is that a particular melody will suggest something anyway like you'll start saying a particular phrase over it even if it's nonsense which might sound like something that might be yeah something it's got the right rhythm you can put yeah, a different exactly. set of words in afterwards yeah yeah or you know, the music itself will suggest a particular mood or space or place. And then you can kind of say, oh, well, if I'm in a field, then maybe I can sing about this horse that's there, you know. That sort of thing. <laughs> and we've had people talk about that as well. So, all right, carry on, Simon. What have you got next? What have you got to show us next? Well, come back to the, some of these issues later on. Go uh, on. Should we go with concert tickets? Go on. Yeah, yeah go what on. Have you got? Oh, yeah, what have you got? I was just went up through my attic last night and scrabbled around for some of my old things. I found this. I thought this was quite interesting. Speaking of our kind of early 90s grunge era, this is a letter from the GMEX Centre in Manchester, set re Nirvana concert, 27th of March, 1994. And it says, due to circumstances... Oh, cancelled. Outside of our control, Nirvana, scheduled for March 94, is postponed until the 14th of April 1994. Of course, Kirk Cobain passed away on the 5th of April. That's so this was never to be. Oh, wow. Oh. So these, these must be the tickets from the Nirvana concert that never yeah. happened. Yeah, right. Well. So you were, you were a fan? I think we were probably playing both sides of the Seattle debate at the time, listening to bands like Pearl Jam and Nirvana, you know? Um, and there was always those kind of playground debates about what was really grunge. Um, oh, that was like, <laughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> David and I, strangely, you might not believe us, were too old for that. <laughs> no, go on. What, 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 what was the definition of grunge for you? I think it was supposed to be something that was, well, I mean, obviously all these bands were kind of co-opted by, you know, Geffen and Epic and all kinds yeah. of labels, but um, I think it was supposed to be something that was more artistically authentic and honest, like Nirvana, whereas Pearl Jam was maybe seen as being a bit kind of corporate and a bit kind of, uh, you know, coming out of more of an 80s rock kind of vibe. Well, even I, who, who don't really know much about either of them, I caught that distinction as well. But I think what that proves is Nirvana was just really good at positioning themselves as being something slightly different, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. the difficult trick to pull off, isn't it? You 
and they very often do it at the beginning of their career and it never deserts them you absolutely know? no matter how big the label is behind yeah, them how much marketing or whereas pearl whatever. jam pearl jam is still the guys on sony or cbs or whatever the label they were on they they, they, they were tarred with that kind of brush weren't they absolutely. Whereas, <laughs> Well, well, they were more Pearl Jam guys, weren't we? Yeah. More, yeah. More than I think so. Yeah. I mean, and creatively, you know, they, they all do interesting things in their own way, I think. Right, right. What have you got, Brian? Um, well, on a gig related note, uh, I brought this, which is a tour program for, uh, well, not, it wasn't a tour, it was a, uh, it was a residency. Um, Sparks 21 Nights in London in uh, oh, right. 2008 when they played uh, every one of their albums to that point on consecutive nights or nearly consecutive nights um, and I attended I think half a dozen of those shows <laughs> God, Sparks were a huge deal for me obviously um, it's and... amazing how often Sparks come up on these uh, video cuffs isn't it Dave there's just, it is. just so much affection for them why did you like them so much I mean they're very complicated ornate kind of cabaret based in some, some extent songs aren't they yeah it's, it's hard to pinpoint what it is I, I first got into them it's nearly well about 17 18 years ago maybe when L- Lil Beethoven came out I don't know if you know that album um, but it was just kind of the it was that album was just in all the end of year best album lists in all, all the music magazines and stuff. And, and just on a kind of a, a punt, really, I just thought, oh, I'm going to, I'll grab that. And and then I saw Come On In My House in the rack as well. So I thought, I'll grab that as well. Cause I like this town ain't big enough for the both of us. So I'll just see, you know, and, and, and just kind of fell in love with both for, for kind of different reasons. Um, and just found it remarkable that, you know, these albums have been made kind of, I guess, 30 years apart by the same two guys it was so incredibly different, um, and that just kind of says it all about about them. They just they've just continually found ways to sort of reinvent themselves. They yeah. never kind of stay still. They're always sort of challenging themselves, doing different things. Like they've just um, they've just done the music for a musical that's just come out on net. Um, they they wrote music for a film that, that didn't actually. It was a radio play called The Seduction of Ingmar Bergman. Um, they've just done kind of everything really they're just always interesting um i think ron mail is is one of the great songwriters full stop both lyrically and, and melodically um russell is one of the great vocalists doesn't get the credit he does it you know during that run the guy had to sing you know 21 albums from start to finish remember all the words he wasn't using a prompter oh uh, really um all the songs i think were in the original keys except for one called equator which i think they dropped down like a semitone um because that is ridiculously high that song but it's just this incredible display of of sort of singing ability and um and these gigs just really cemented you know for me mm. Especially the little Beethoven. I went to the little Beethoven performance, and, and there's a song on that album called "My Baby's Taking Me Home," which, for all the kind of ornate melodies that Ron has written and great lyrics, it's just one line. It's just one line. That, that whole album was an exercise in kind of repetition, kind of a Steve yeah. kind of thing. And and this one is just that line: "My baby's taking me home," and it's just under this kind of jaunty piano uh, sequence. And they just change the music underneath as it goes. So it goes from major to minor. They change the dynamics. It goes soft. It goes heavy at the end. There's a little spoken word sex in the middle, but it's mostly just that line repeated over and over again. And I just adored this track for, for years. And then, you know, this particular song on, on when they played it in, in the um, Islington residency, just got the longest ovation I've ever heard of, from any gig I've ever attended. Like you hear about, oh, things getting several minutes ovation yeah. and stuff you think oh yeah right but honestly it, 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 people just wouldn't stop cheering for this song applauding it Ron and Russell looked kind of taken aback and it was just it just struck me that wow you know somehow with that song he took this one line and musically found a way to set it so that it just it just hit, it hit this kind of emotion and just hit people emotionally in this way that you can't really kind of put your finger on 
But, it must be so thrilling as a songwriter to find people have looked at your music and your lyrics and, and, and worked out those kind of details. There's a guy called Rodri Marsden, who I'm sure you know does these little yes. clips about where he'll take one little chord in a, in a Whitney Houston song or something yeah. explain why it's so extraordinary or Ghost Town. And it must be so wonderful to be the songwriter. I think someone's appreciated all my uh, all my melodies that I've put in there, the complexity yeah. of what I do. Well, I mean, with this, there's not even, um, uh, you know, it's literally what, just one line repeated yet. Yeah. With the repetition, it just takes on more and more uh, sort of significance. I, I don't know what it is. It's, I recommend anyone listen to the track and see what they think. But um, the response to that song has stayed with me for years, That the response of that gig. It's just one of the most powerful kind of moments or any gig I've, I've been to. It was just, Brilliant. Uh, but, you know, in response to this track, that's just one line repeated over and over yeah, again. Yeah. And, um, you know, for all of, again, of, of Ron's sort of songwriting skill, that song seems to, like, hit people yeah. more than anybody, any any other song, you know. So you've you spoken to them. You, mm -hmm. You've had them as guests. What did they tell you? Oh, so I can, you, can you remember what they told us? Um, I think I remember getting the impression that Ron doesn't think um, about what Russell might or might not be able to do vocally. He just writes the melodies that he wants to hear. And if that happens to be a very difficult melody to perform, then so be it. And Russell has to kind of accommodate that. I thought that was quite an interesting dynamic. I don't know if that's a brotherly thing or or just a kind of a, a way of pushing someone creatively, mm. but... Um, that was an interesting dynamic that we wouldn't normally have come across because most people who talk about collaboration or co-writing are very sensitive to the other person's needs and want to kind of set it yeah. in the best light or check for their range and then write the melody in their comfortable range and all this business. Um, but yeah. yeah, Ron and Russell were just like, no, the work needs to be what the work needs to be and, and Russell yeah. will deal with it. Yeah. yeah. I okay. thought it was good. So, well, Simon, over to you. What have you got next? Um, well, staying on that Pearl Jam theme... <laughs> <laughs> all right i've got that record all oh, right um, okay. which it obviously isn't much to look at it's basically a sheep caught in a fence isn't it it's but, a sheep um, fence. this was the first record that i actually remember looking forward to i would say because like we said you know we were sort of into that side of things growing up and at school and stuff and uh this was 93 versus the pearl jam album nice so yeah so uh, 10 had come out in 1991 and uh, that had been a big success obviously uh, and there was a couple of years and when you when you're that age a couple of years is a lifetime so oh, I just remember thinking there's another album on the way and then there was a lot of anticipation for that and then when it started to come the reviews were really good and then I remember it sold like a million copies in the first week or something it broke a record for like a fastest selling you know early release of an album and I thought right I'll, I'll have to get this and wasn't disappointed really I remember being really happy with the uh, this is a kind of a follow-on I think they uh that might have been the first album they did with Brendan O'Brien in fact it must have been um and so I think that was a, a really strong decision for that band to moving forward because they moved away from a more kind of uh washy classic rock kind of sound and into something more dry and contemporary and a bit more alternative. And that probably held them in good stead. I think that's probably one of the reasons they're still around is that they forged that creative relationship with Brendan O'Brien. Uh, um, in your talking to loads of songwriters, how have you found um, songwriting within bands differs from songwriting in other forms? There must be a huge amount of kind of politics and, personal relationships in this yeah I, I guess we tend to find that there's usually one maybe two people Ooh. who are responsible mainly for the songwriting not everyone in a band will contribute and if they do a five-way split on songwriting is quite complicated even though it might be set up as a split like that in general anyway no matter who writes the songs um the actual creative contributions i find usually come from one or two people who are really committed to sitting down and generating something from scratch. I, I yeah. guess an exception to that might be um, we had Matt Berninger on uh, quite recently from The National uh -huh. and, and that seems they are quite a collaborative process that they they have. It tends to be they have, he has the instrumentalists in the band sort of create um, kind of backing tracks almost instrumental backing tracks which they'll then send to, to Matt the singer and he'll sort of Put them into like garage band or whatever, and just free, free form over them. Um, 
and to his heart's content, and then he'll he'll go back and kind of sift through his sort yeah. of free form. That's exactly gibberish. the technique that uh, that REM used, didn't they? Say, with Michael yeah, Stipe, yeah. and I think right. with, uh, the, the, the Smith used with Morrissey. They just made a series of of uh, chord sequence. Uh, backing tracks, really, you know, and just sent them on a cassette, seeing if anything kind of came up in terms of melody and the lyric. It's a really interesting idea. That's it, yeah. So that's what's what um, what's what Matt Berninger does at the yeah. yeah, he just sifts through. He, he just sings a load of gibberish over the top of a backing track, goes through, and goes, "Oh, that, oh, that sounds like it could, I could be saying that." And he'll almost decipher his own gibberish, and then yeah. usually, you know, he'll find kind of meaning within the gibberish, you know, and and sort of uh, construct the lyric out of. Out of that, yeah, yeah. If the gibber is, is catchy enough, people find meaning, don't they, very quickly? Yeah. You know, yeah. Or, or uh, what you might find is that your your brain is giving you something that you wouldn't consciously yeah. have produced, and then it might be buried in there somewhere. Yeah. And you can tease that out. Yeah. 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 So, Brian, Brian okay. what, yeah, over to you. Um, well, I opted for the first album I ever owned, which right. is uh, Prince's Batman soundtrack. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry. I hope it's not uh, grossly offensive to hold a proper CD on this. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> I think but, my uh, Batman is in a little, little black tin, isn't yours, Mark? I've never seen one like that. No, I, I, I think it wasn't. It did it come out in a special package of some kind? I think it was a tin. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I mean, my my original copy was a cassette, which I got with my my first Walkman uh, in on uh, Christmas '89. It would have been when the, right, ba- right. the Batman movie was huge, and I was a massive fan of. Batman and a total comics geek and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And um, so anything to do with that, um, I, I wanted any piece of merchandise, whatever, any, any tie-in book, graphic novel. And then this came along as well, which is Prince's um, soundtrack, which I still think is unfairly maligned, by the way. I think there's some credit of the future, uh, Party Man, Electric Chair, some great tracks on it. Are um, you a Prince completist? Well, this is the thing. This, this was my gateway into Prince, basically, which is why I thought... First one's free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, this was sort of... Uh, yeah, my gateway into Prince. I'm a lifelong Prince fan now, as is Cy. Si. Right. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say I went straight from this to buying, you know, Dirty Mind and Controversy and stuff. It was a few years before. Right. Um, it probably tied in with when I became a bass player and stuff and just started getting into listening to music properly. Then I set about, you know, listening to the Beatles properly and and Prince as well, and, and really discovering the kind of back catalogue. Um, and it's just something that stayed with me ever since, really. And, and same for Psy, to the point that we uh, we went to uh, Paisley Park a few years ago. Oh, right. we, uh, yeah, there was a celebration event the year after he died. It was on the first anniversary of his his death, and they had a, like a four day. Um, events at Paisley Park consisting of panels and um, sort of exhibitions of all his, you know, his, his, his tour costumes and um, all kinds of sort of paraphernalia. And he had concerts as well by like the Revolution and the Time. Um, George Clinton was there and stuff. This is a four-track recorder. Um, Alan Sugar's got a lot to answer for, I yes. think, with this one. Yes. Um, so basically... Um, me and Brian started getting into this idea of recording our ideas. Right. I was always interested in recording technology anyway. Yeah. Um, not that you call this technology, but um, <laughs> we, at the time we were, we were at secondary school. This was sort of mid nineties. We were doing GCSE music and our school was a Catholic school run by monks. And um, our, our music teacher was a, a, you could call him a funky monk. I suppose he was um, really a, Inter- he was he was interested in the kind of music we were interested in. He recommended a lot of stuff to us that we thought was great, like XTC, for example. Right, right. And um, we bought this from him for fifty quid from the music school. From the <laughs> you bought it from a monk, from a funky yeah. monk. <laughs> it's improbable it, as that Catholic sounds. School. It <laughs> fell off the back of a monastery. Yeah. Monk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These retail for about uh, two nine nine, so not a bad deal, I think. So yeah, it was uh, the first. The, this is the object that we made all our original demos on on cassette. These faders weren't very good. They, uh, I think that's every, brilliant. I can well imagine. Was, uh, every movement was like trying to radio. NASA that was the space. enormous breakthrough, wasn't it? Because prior to that time, and it's so it fascinates me this because we forget about this stuff so quickly that. Up until then, 
if you wanted to multi-track anything, you had to go, you had to to go, and, find, you had to go and find a professional. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and pay yeah. a top dollar. Oh, it's Whatever. incredible, really, isn't it? Yeah. And you couldn't muck about with it. You couldn't afford to muck about with it, could you? You had to of course. put yourself in their hands. Whereas <laughs> as soon as you got that kind of thing, because nowadays you can do it with your phone pretty much, can't you? Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And a lot of the people we speak to are basically making records on their phones in the sense that they will record something at such a high resolution that they'll say, well, I really like the vibe of that part. I'll, I'll just put that straight into the record and build on top of that. And so a lot of the records we are sent these days have parts in them that were recorded in that way. But yeah, the, I mean, the emergence of stuff like that and the, the Tascam Porter studio and that was really mm-hmm. a sea change, I think, for being able to do stuff. And we spent hours, didn't we, Bri, just dubbing parts on four track and then bouncing them down and then we adding did. a few more, you know. And, and, and you still have the tapes, much to my consternation. <laughs> <laughs> You haven't thought about doing a box set full of all your kind of uh, oh, your sketches, your archive. Those are buried. Those are buried. <laughs> yeah, they're not seeing the light of day anytime soon. No, they, well, it, really, we were sort of we were learning to play on those things, you know, which it, it benefited us in the sense that you know, if, you, if you're recording yourself constantly, you can hear where you, you need to improve. So, so I think it helped us a lot in that way as well. We weren't just recording our songs; we we're also sort of hearing ourselves back all the time are playing and going over oh, maybe work on that a little bit so i think it really helped us develop as musicians as well let alone songwriters right yeah. uh, so going back to you know what you're saying people send stuff to you so people still try to they still try to hang on to the the kind of raw element in whatever they did early on that must be quite difficult to preserve that in the production process of making a record is that the case yeah, absolutely. Because that whole phenomenon that the you know, you know the spirit of the demo is the thing, and then you always spend your time chasing the demo and trying to when you do it properly in the studio, it's you know, not as good. It's never mm-hmm. as good. So, what one of the things that we've been being told over the last few years is that people, because the barriers to access recording technologies are so low now, people are recording at such a high resolution at home that they they basically start the writing process and they're recording as they're writing. And then the things that they keep that have that vibe, they're able to just go ahead and use because um, it's of sufficient quality for a master recording, basically. Right. So, yeah, there is... They're sealing in the freshness, basically, from, from the start. <laughs> yeah, they're trying to basically skip over the demo stage. There's really no point in doing that. If they can capture the energy of a, a moment where something came together for the first time in that kind of usable quality, then... And that's the thing to keep. So you, you, you've talked to people, presumably, among among the many songwriters you talk to, you talk to people who are in the, I think, what do they call it, the track and hook business of, of, make, of making, of writing songs nowadays. Explain for people who still think, poor benighted souls like me, who still think writing songs is two people with a, sitting around with a guitar, how it's different and what, what you know, from the people you've talked to. Well, I mean, that idea of track and hook is a reference to John Seabrook's book, The Song Machine, yeah. where he talks about um, going to different uh, recording locations like Los Angeles and New York and places like that and sitting down with um, some of the major songwriting teams like Stargate or um, you know Max Martin. Max yeah, Martin. Might be. Yeah. And, and a lot of the way that these people work is that they produce a, a finished track and then they'll invite freelancers into top line on that. So it's the idea that there's a track and then a hook, and you're looking for that person to come in and give you the hook that's going to make it a saleable product. And but so he also don't... talks in that book about about uh, vocals being comped together syllable by syllable. Um, I, I was really, I suppose, I was a bit shocked by that. Is that is that a standard procedure that people don't just go in and sing a whole verse? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So you're just finding the best syllable and just and just bolting that onto the next best, the next one. And the I think next it's one. because it's such a producer-led approach. Idiot. If a producer yeah. has a vision in mind for how exactly how that melody needs to be performed or realised, then they they're going to take the S from that word and then the the perfect rendition of that second part of the word from somewhere else, and they're going to construct it exactly as they want it to be, rather than looking for some kind of emotional performance from an artist yes. where there might be yeah. perfections. Yeah, that's how we record our podcast intros as well. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple takes, best syllable from 
<laughs> yes. Weeks of, of, of yeah. editing. That's I right. tell you, it's interesting that that whole thing, I remember first reading about that in, a, in an interview with Paul Simon in Rolling Stone in, I think, 1972, talking about There Goes Rhyme in Simon, and we talked about punching in. Mm-hmm. And the first time anybody I'd, I'd ever heard anybody talk about it. So, and that was obviously with very crude technology compared to the technology because, you know, it was, you had to look at the tape in those days, didn't you? And decide where you were going to, where you're going to drop it in, which you don't do nowadays, but it goes way back, you know, that, that kind of thing. How do you, I, I'm just interested in this. Do you find that, um, that because everything you can kind of look at music nowadays, can't you? You can see it on a kind of readout. Mm-hmm. You can see where the peaks and troughs are. Do, do you think that's beneficial to the making of music or not? I mean, yeah, it's it's beneficial. In, I mean, there are so many benefits of of digital audio and digital recording and, and the convenience of it and the way it's done. But um, does it inspire great performances to look at a waveform? Probably. Some producers say that if you look, if you physically look at the shape of the music, you just see all the spaces. And when you see the spaces, you think you ought to fill them. But <laughs> well, actually, like when it. you couldn't look at music before, you could only hear it, you often wouldn't want to interrupt those spaces and leave them as they were. I remember working with a, I remember working with a producer who we were doing a playback and he went over and turned the monitor off the screen. Good to see. So that we could just listen and we didn't yeah. look because it is true. And I found that editing podcasts actually that when I look at the waveform, I see things yes. that I know are lip smacks and clicks yeah. and mouths, and I'll go in and take them out. Whereas if I just listen, I can probably just hear yeah. past that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, funny. Yeah. So Brian, over to you. What have you got? Have you got a piece of technology? Uh, no, not a piece of technology. It's related to our. Um, our sort of songwriting endeavours uh, in another way. It's a, it's a gig poster. I did have a bigger version of this, but I'll go for the smaller one. Um, oh, that was the group you were in, wasn't this it? This is the band so, we were yeah. in from uh, about, well, in various permutations from um, about 1998 to 2007, something like that. Um, and this was our, our last gig of, I'm going to guess that was 2003, last gig of the year, Christmas blowout party. <laughs> um, and uh, it was in support of uh, we made an album self-produced an album called Motion Picture and uh, we were sort of we'd done some dates that year and this was our last our last one of the year that says Digital Wings down there that was the label we, we created to put it out on um, I think that was a, a lyric from one of our songs as well possibly right? yeah. yeah I mean the name Santa Carla comes from the film The Lost Boys it's the, the town in The Lost Boys the murder capital oh right, <laughs> oh, right. yeah so and uh, we had a song on the album called Mr. Operator as well so hence there's the switchboard operators on the uh, in the poster but uh, but yeah that was sort of our main that band was our songwriting kind of um, vehicle really for for quite a few years um, and yeah. where we sort of learned to kind of I think where we've properly learned to write songs together, because I think initially Cy was the, the, the songwriter, and I would just sort of come up with bass lines to the songs, and then at some point um, we just started to actually join forces and, and, and co-write from, from scratch. Do, so, do, um, you, do you ever have the experience, I was going to mention this when you talk about McCartney earlier on, that um, the songwriters always say, I always get the impression when talking to songwriters, that they think songs are things that kind of arrive. Mm. And, and their main anxiety when they write a good one is that somebody's written it already and that all they're doing is recalling it. Uh, do you find that and have people talked about that? People yeah. do talk about, yes, yeah, songs sort of being in the ether and occasionally, you know, if you're receptive enough, you know, yeah. you'll, you'll pick one up. Um, if you I'm always a little bit up. suspicious of that. Approach, yeah, I am to too. be honest. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. God. I just I like the idea of human agency, <laughs> and I just I just feel like um, the sort of conduit thing, like it flowed through me. I I am but a humble tune smith in this. Is it false yeah. modesty a lot of the time? I, I yeah. think so. I think it so. Seems I like think, it to me. Yeah, I think some yeah. people they 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 like the mystery of it. They like to to, to think there's some kind of magic involved. And I think to some degree there there is, but. Um, yeah, I'm the chosen I mean, one that will download yeah, this from the social I mean, cloud. Yeah, yeah, I feel the same way about people who say that as I do about, you know, when people win a Grammy or an Oscar and 
credit it to God. This, you know, I didn't do this. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Like, well, like, no, in the, in, in credit, you know, it was you. You put the in word their, in. In their defense, and I'm no songwriter or musician, I do think I've always admired this about musicians of any level. I can sit at the piano and I can plunk a few chords and it will never resolve itself to my ears into a shape of any kind. <laughs> Whereas a musician will hit the same chords and will hear yeah. patterns which they can repeat. I can do that with words. I can't do it with music at all. So I think a lot of it is just recognizing what is going through you or what you've read or heard and then being able to move it along a bit exactly it's all stuff that's kind of swirling around your brain yeah i think, I think in this in that sense yet yeah, it's sort of in the ether in a sense it's it's up there swirling around yeah. and, and you just got to sort of yeah be able to oh hang on that's a nice yeah, there is something Fragments there it's recognized yeah. it's oh, recognized yeah. in the thing that is there yeah, or I'm, sure the, I'm sure the same thing applies with painting or anything. You know, yeah, yeah. Is recognizing what you've done and how you can move it somewhere. Developing it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there is always that sense that, you know, one minute there is nothing, and two minutes later there is something there. Yeah, that's and that, lovely. And that does feel like magic when that happens. Yeah. Especially like we've had stories from people who've said, "Oh, I wrote that one in five minutes." And it always seems like, oh, did you really? And then, you know, it comes Especially to pass Especially when the that... song's seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but it comes to pass that they actually did write it, you know, in a corridor outside the studio and then went in and recorded it. And, you know, some well-known songs have been written that way. But, but do you yeah, ever the... worry, as David was sort of saying, that, you know, when you, you're writing a song and a chord sequence comes to you, that that, that chord sequence consciously or, or unconsciously has come directly from another song? Because um, quite often, if you play a certain chord, it'll lead to another, and then it'll resolve in a. It'll go from a G to a B minor to an E minor or something. That's been done a million times, but it just yeah, of course, right. yeah. I think you've got to kind of disabuse yourself of of that kind of anxiety. Really, the fact is, there's nothing new under the sun at this point in terms in terms of of pop, yeah. Song, in terms of chord structures and things like that, you know, you, you find interesting voicings and things. Maybe find the, the odd change. Maybe no one's read them before, but generally. It's it's kind of being done in terms of chord sequences and stuff. Um, I think what's what's always unique is is you, you know. So regardless of whether you're just writing over a G, a C, and a D, yeah, what you, yeah, uh, laying over the top of it, yeah. And it's not being afraid of that, really. You, you know, it's it's embracing your own sort of individuality and not being afraid of you know. It, so you're using simple chords. So what if they're all that's required? It's fine. Yeah. Plenty of people are still writing great songs with G, C, and D, um, you know, uh, and they always will because they're tried and trusted, and, and that's all right. You know, it's just it's your own individual stamp is going over the top of it. So kind of, you know, we had John Batiste on recently. Um, he was a phenomenal kind of jazz music musician, and he's, he's the band leader on the late show with Stephen Colbert. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, unbelievable musician, incredibly inspirational figure, and he's got an album out. And a lot of the songs on that are very, very straightforward kind of blues structures and things, kind of 12-bar structures, very simple. But he has such a strong identity as a, as a person, as an artist, that it doesn't matter. Yeah. Don't even kind of notice it so much. Um, so I think... You know, I'm not saying don't be ambitious with 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 songwriting and try and find an interest or oh, need an interesting change here or whatever. But it's not the be all and the end all, really, because you can mm. still come up with very interesting stuff with. And it's also, you know, it, it, not every song has to be you singing over an acoustic guitar or playing a piano. It, the treatments, what you're putting underneath, yeah, um, you know, what the how you're making up the backing track, and that can sort of disguise almost this, the simplicity of a of a chord sequence. Who's the person? Who's the person you'd like to have as a guest and you haven't been able to get? Oh God, um, Bob Barry Gibb. Barry Gibb. Eric. Oh yeah. right, love to talk to Barry Gibb. Yeah, um, there's a lot of American sort of titans that we haven't had on, like uh, Springsteen, Carol King, Dolly Parton. Yeah, you will in time. I'm well, sure. how, how do you go about it? We well, just well, get offered people really these days. 
because we've yeah. been around for a long time now. So we're pretty much just fielding offers. Oh, really? You're turning them away? Just yeah. Paul Simon, it's... just go and wait over there <laughs> <laughs> in the but corner. You, they, they must be so thrilled to be given the opportunity to talk about songwriting because they so very rarely ever do. You know, they, everyone wants to know about their CV and their life and their and their yeah. their, 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 their personal life and their you know their, their story really, and, and they never get any any interest in in explaining their craft. Yeah. So I would have thought. I can't yeah. see why you wouldn't get Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, I'm sure it's just, it's sometimes it's not, I mean, I'm sure Bruce Springsteen will be up for it. It's often, it's getting beyond his. <laughs> yeah, like, absolutely. Um, I mean, what do you do? Do you go direct? I mean, I well, know it's have, difficult. We have, we have gone direct with lots of people. It, Generally had, speaking, it's the first and best approach. Well, Dude. it's true. We've had situations over the years where we've contacted someone, like in the earlier days, we used to reach out to people and um, we've contacted them and they've said, oh no, no chance or you know not right now or whatever and then we've just messaged them on twitter the actual artist yeah. and they asked oh yeah sounds great yes. <laughs> Absolutely. it happens a lot that there's people around those people who are trying to protect the you know their schedules or whatever but yeah um, chris difford we got that way i seem to remember we just sort of tweeted them and he was like yeah love to yep yeah carol <laughs> bear sega we got that way of all people that was i i bet you see because <laughs> You know, and whereas if we'd gone through a publish a publicist or manager or whatever, we'd we'd still be waiting now probably to get. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm I'm sure you're right. But, but you can like as um just to mention what Mark was saying about you know they must be kind of relieved and it, I think you really do get that sense. You get a palpable sense of oh god, great, this is about song great. You can feel no one's going to mention my ex-wife. It's just yeah, wonderful. yeah, yeah. yeah. And on some episodes, we've you know we we've had this like messages from listeners saying you can hear. The point where where a guest just kind of thaws <laughs> and uh, and and just kind of gives himself up to the thing and and just gets into it and it's like right so so this is just going to be about the music then fantastic yeah um, there are certain songwriters I think Paddy Macaloon's one and I think Andy Partridge probably another actually who you can feel in the ether that there's something building towards a a, a greater sense of recognition for what they do do, do is there anybody else you, you think oh well, those two articulate but are there any is there anyone you think deserves a, a lot more credit who, who people don't take enough notice of oh um. There have been some people we've championed, and and like for example, Mike Viola, we've had on the podcast yes. a couple oh. of times yeah. now, who we think is just fantastic and uh, not necessarily you know widely lauded for his talents, but it's just a brilliant songwriter who's collaborated with all kinds of people. You know, I'd never heard of him at all until I, I just ended up with a record of his about seven or eight years ago, which has a song on it called the "Soundtrack of My Summer." Yeah. yeah. Brilliant which I just song. play again and again and again. And everything I've heard by him since, I loved. And yeah. it's all very different, isn't it? Yeah. You've had him twice, I think. Yeah. We have. Yeah, we've had a few people. We've had Pat, Patty McAloon on, on twice. Right. Um, we'll make, we'll make exceptions so, sometimes for people. Uh, but, yeah, no, Mike's unbelievable. Um, and we stay kind of... We've almost become kind of friendly with him over the years. Right. Well. We've kept in touch with him and stuff, and he really champions what we do which is which is really nice you know to get the sort of uh approbation of, of, of yeah. something like that is is really lovely we wouldn't yeah. have expected that when when we started but yeah Mike's but how long have you been doing it and how many have you done it's 10 years in november oh good great oh wow and we've done 203 episodes we've got stamina what can we say <laughs> <laughs> that's phenomenal <laughs> So are you, are you like us? You take a bit of a sniffy view of all these people who suddenly arrived in podcasting in the yes. last year. Ah, we've got a podcast. You said, Whoa, where, have you been? Been? <laughs> where have you been? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we started in, two th- what was it, 2008, wasn't it, though? Yeah. Something like well, that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, maybe yeah, behind closed doors, we can be a little bit catty. I'll admit it. <laughs> yeah. um, Surely not. We'll, we'll talk later. <laughs> right. Where have we so, got to, Simon? Simon, to I think you? it's Simon's turn for it. I think yeah. it's your so, final object, Simon. That's right, yeah. Right? Yeah, uh, so here's a book which I'm sure you gents already know. This is Songwriters I, I, on Songwriting by Paul Zollo. I have never read that. No, it's, I have neither. It is a weighty tome, as I can see. But it is basically the book that inspired our podcast. Um, you might notice some similarity between Songwriters on Songwriting and So the Jerker on Songwriting. So what you... <laughs> Do you just go through the index and say, oh, who's <laughs> next week? Well, basically, <laughs> we, we were really inspired by this book. It, it basically features long-form interviews with songwriters yeah, about yeah. their craft, and it, it's got, um, you know, people in there like uh, Donald Fagan and yeah. um, Carol King and Paul Simon and Bob Dylan, etc. And we just thought, well, 
you know, this is really insightful. Maybe we could do something like this in podcast form and, and have these conversations. And um, so we sort of use that as not as a, a we don't really go through it like a, a manual <laughs> or nothing, but yeah. um, it, 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 it's something of a Bible in the songwriting field these days that people regard it as a, a really um, great contribution. And there's a second volume as well that adds more interviews to. Right. So I would say if anyone's interested in, reading about the process and not necessarily listening to us talk about it, then that's a really good point of call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. That's There's brilliant. a great book also um, by the same author, uh, Paul Zollo, um, Conversations with Tom Petty, which, uh, I mean, Tom Petty's in that first volume, isn't he? He is, second? yeah. yeah. Um, and basically he met with Tom Petty for, for a period of kind of months in sort of mid, mid-2000s. And just went through his whole kind of recording career to that point and all his albums and discussed songwriting with him. And for for Tom Petty fans in particular, it's it's just absolutely essential. But he's just, a very insightful person, Tom Petty. He, he was. Oh, he was, yeah. Um and he it's just it's a really just a really inspiring book. He he had such a kind of um down to earth sort of view of songwriting. He made it seem very accessible the way he talked about it. And obviously when you sit down and try and write a song like Tom Petty, it's it's much harder than he makes it seem. But I like people who kind of, I like people who demystify the, the process, you know, and uh, yeah. make it feel like you can do it. And you read this book and you think, I could maybe, have, you know, have a bash at this. I might reach the levels of, of uh, you know, American Girl or something. But, you know, it, it, it gives you something to kind of shoot at. But it's just a great book, really engrossing. Right. And if you're a Tom Petty fan, it's essential, really. What have you got, Brian, your final object? Well, yeah, mine. Well, I I hope you'll accept a double submission. Um, (laughs) These are the first two Beatles books I ever... Oh, uh, Oh, yeah, Revolution of the Head. This I had to rebuy. I I can't find my original copy, which which to my chagrin. Um, But, yeah, this and uh, Summer of Love by George Martin, um, which I bought in very quick success. And I think Summer of Love was first. I think I had a book token for W. H. Smith's. Right. And thought I'll start. And, and around the, the time, I think it was anthology time and Free as a Bird and all that stuff. So the Beatles were kind of in the air a lot. And, um, you know, I've been a fan since I was kind of uh, nine, ten, listening to my dad's albums and stuff. But again, as with Prince, when I became, started playing the guitar, playing the bass and stuff, I took much, a much deeper interest in um, how the songs were written. Um, and all that kind of thing. And these books really sort of opened my eyes considerably to not just the, the songwriting, but just the kind of innovations they made in the studio and, and all that kind of stuff. It was just, um, yeah, again, just a, a gateway really into yeah. uh, into the, the world of the Beatles, which I'm yet to retreat from. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't think you ever will retreat from No, no. That, it goes for all of us. But it just... Yeah. Yeah, but it was it just, just great because up to that point, you know, I, I didn't really have a, a sense of that who was singing on war, who was playing on war, that they swapped instruments on certain things. And, and so just getting into, as I was saying, you know, we really were getting into kind of reading the liner notes and finding out we were really into, we wanted to know who did what. We were always like that, be it with music or watching films or, you know, we were always reading the credits for things and, and just getting to find out that kind of information and, um, and again, in terms of Revolution in the Head in particular, the way that opened up the, the songwriting and what was going on in some of those songs, the complexities of some of those songs. that Completely changed play. the way people wrote about pop music, that book. It's well, absolutely, absolutely amazing. I mean, you know, it's not... Um, I have I have issues with it now, but just, that's just because I'm less biddable than I was as a 15, 16-year-old. I agree. But it's the idea that someone, the first time someone tack- tackled both the kind of what inspired the song, but also yes. the technicalities of the music itself. Which yeah, fantastic. it's an unbelievable achievement. And and yet, you know, a lot of the opinions I, I disagree with now. I, I kind that, of, that doesn't matter, really. Oh, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I, I do feel like maybe there's a bit of, it's responsible for a bit of received opinion now about certain yeah. songs. You kind of see certain songs coming for a kick and again and again. And oh, yeah. Like, Across the universe, just, he says, is lazy and rubbish or something. Yeah, and, it? just and a lot of balls. Because it's got no balls. middle eight. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and stuff like Maxwell Silverhammer and 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 things like that, and Obla Dee, Obla Da, uh, which, you know, I mean, I can, I can kind of, I understand sort of where he's coming from, but at the same time, kind of people love those songs. They did. Responsible they did a songs. really finely crafted record. He maybe overlooks that a little bit, um, but, you know, just to, in, in favour. That's just his Lennon bias, isn't it? 
So are we at Greatest Records, Dave? Yes. Greatest Records ever made. Come yes. on. What have we got? Who's going first? I'll well, go first. Si, do you want to go first? Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned um, Paddy McAloon before. Oh, right. So I thought... Well, that's the second time recently oh. we've had that. Really? Well, it is, yeah. No, it's we all right. It's another wrong with that. motorcycle on the front, which is from The Great Escape. It's the yeah, same nice. one. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So this is Steve McQueen by Prefab Sprout, produced right. by Thomas Dolby. Thomas Dolby. And uh, I just, I remember discovering it and just being completely wrapped up in that atmosphere that they create on that record and that sort of very romantic, unrequited kind of uh, passion that's in there. You know, like a song like When Love Breaks Down, to me, is still kind of an inspiration songwriting wise it's something to aspire to i think you know if you can capture something like that melodically and atmospherically in a song i think you're you're onto something so okay and and but... having met paddy twice and well we we recorded with him once and then met with him uh, this for the second one and we've had such great experiences with him both times um, it just really enhances your appreciation mm. for the music right. so fabulous yeah, guy Steve and that McQueen. looks like leonardo da vinci yeah <laughs> okay brian what have you got What's well your... I, I actually don't have it to hand but it, okay. it, it's the white album so you know okay the most visually stimulating we know what it looks like <laughs> um so yeah i mean as crushingly predictable as it is to <laughs> to pick a beatles album i just kind of can't get past that one really just in terms of it, it for me anyway it's impossible to get bored of yeah um, it, there's such an incredible range of material that's on the it. thing it's the mm. right the range, you know, it's it's probably got the, I would, for my money, the best one-two punch of an opening couple of tracks uh, of any album. Back in the USSR into Dear Prudence, I just think, you know, I, I defy anyone to beat that, quite honestly. Um, it, it, I just feel like kind of all of life is represented on that album. It's 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 exciting. It's it's kind of touching. It's weird. It's unsettling. It's daft. It's it's even it's a bit the, scary occasionally. It's the daft stuff. You see, yeah. going back to going back to Max, Maxwell's Silver Hammer and so forth. The daft stuff was a hugely important part of the Beatles. It was the corny it, stuff was a hugely important part of the really Beatles. Was. Well, my take know, that away, and they're they're the birds. Yes. Well, not <laughs> not to get on my soapbox, but I've often felt that if you sort of call yourself a huge Beatles fan, but then decry. You know, your mother should know, or yeah. or that sort of. Thing. I'm like, are you really? Because those things are what make them what they are, as much as every bit as much as the edgy stuff. Yeah, the cartoonish yeah. stuff. It's lovely. And it was part of talk you know, about musical. That Ford William music hall element was mm. they they heard that before they heard rock and roll. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. Really ingrained in them as yeah, honey anybody pie, Holly yeah. or or what song or whatever. It it was. You know, that was just part of what they heard growing up before rock and roll was even a thing. And and so it found its way into the music because that's what they, you know, they just kind of absorbed all these things and it found its way out. Where I think people see those things as contrivances and maybe Paul just, oh, oh it's Paul showing that he can write in this style. Or, well, you see, well, I, I, think I think it's just part of his... I think a lot of it is the kind of Brit-pop lens through which lots of people look at the Beatles. Yeah. They, they think, well, Oasis wouldn't do that. Why are the Beatles doing <laughs> they were a different kind of thing from a different world, totally, you know. Exactly. Yeah, you know, you can have a song like Rain and then the same band can in, in the same era can can bring Yellow Submarine out, you know. It's, yeah. That, that's what makes them so great. It's that, that incredible range of material and, and there's so many facets to them and, and to sort of write off one of those things, I'm like, you can't call yourself a real... <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. So that's a good challenge, though. Yeah. Call yourself a Beatles fan. You have a T-shirt, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, start fights with people in the street. Well, yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that album. No, it's just for me. It's just a, a, it's a journey. It's a thrilling yeah. journey. And at the end of it, Ringo sings you a lullaby. So yeah, what, what more? Yeah, could absolutely. Well, look, gentlemen, it's been lovely talking to you. What are you doing for the rest I of the day? Know. Writing songs or talking to songwriters? Um, <laughs> well, pr probably prepping to talk to songwriters. I think we've got got some more interviews coming up. So. Got some research to do, some right? To do, um, and so of course, that, we've got another episode to get out, so someone's gonna have to edit that. So, yeah, size the editor, uh, oh, syllable by syllable. We oh. now know, <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's necessary, believe it, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah. We, we take a lot of time over that stuff. We, ju we just feel like 
it's an audio medium, so yeah, yeah. it should be as pleasing to the ear as, as possible. Sometimes we're kind of, well, obviously we listen to a lot of other podcasts as well, and we're slightly mortified sometimes by how many of them are allowed to go out with seemingly no edit whatsoever. Like literally it's, it's just, they just stick it out kind of raw. And, you know, especially if it's a conversation, you know, sometimes you need to sort of tighten it up and just make, you know. Well, you'd be horrified to find that that's what we do. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> this will go out. But you've got the visual element here as well. So this is Warts more, and all. Yeah. <laughs> but this is more of a loose thing. Whereas right. if it's going to be just be listened to, then, you know, people can watch us and see us and, and that changes. Yeah, that. yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if you're just hearing it, you, you want to just make it as smooth listening experience as possible. That's yeah, what we true. endeavor to do anyway. Well, we like to feel we do that live, you know, so. <laughs> much <laughs> yeah, much but for us all. And uh, thanks very much for your time. And I think. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view.